setting the tone for luxury plug-in hybrids. <laughs> I'm Steph. <laughs> I'm Jay. And this is Modern Motoring. Buongiorno. Today we're in the 2024, <laughs> don't roll your eyes at me, 2024 Alfa Romeo Tonale. This is the plug-in hybrid we're driving today. The more powerful and more expensive of the two options available in North America, which also include a gas-only version. Let's start with the outside because there's some fun, cute little bits there. Okay. And some quirky bits. Upsets my need for symmetry. <laughs> so the shape itself, nothing overly exciting. Lots of round bits, lots of curved bits. It's a compact utility vehicle. That's subcompact. Utility. Subcompact, right, yes. subcompact. Or the... Um, uh, Stelvio. Is the compact, right. So a subcompact and it's got their new, they call it three plus three lighting. Mm -hmm. Basically it's a W but if you turn it 90 degrees, that W turns into a three. I think it looks really sharp. Mm. It's really, really nice. On the rear driver's side door at the very top, it's the snake head. Yeah. But the head of the snake is an outlet and it spits out lightning instead of the top. It have, it's here on it's the digital too, instrument is cluster as well. Pretty nice, Yeah. but it's not on the rear passenger side. There is the Italian flag on the mirror cap. I like the grill. It's that classic Alfa Romeo uh, grill. Oh. You know what's terrible about uh. it? You have to put the license plate far to the left. Yes. And I know why, because you can't put it on the grill. You can't put it further below the grill because then it'll rub against the ground. The one thing I don't like is with those rear doors again, there's a tiny bit at the top where if you stand in the wrong spot, you hit your face. Let's talk about the wheels. Mm. They're brass knuckles just wrapped in a big <laughs> circle. It looks <laughs> so ridiculous. I don't I know, have that strong a feeling about it. I know it. people love them and it's just, <laughs> there's no sharp spokes or lines. It's just all around. I don't like it. I, I think it suits the car really well. Outside's done, inside. You yes. go first because okay. I know you have so much to say. I want to start with good things though. Let's. I like the layout of the dash. I like the lighting. That's That insert there mm. lights up reverse lighting at yep. night and looks really, yep. really sharp. I think Volkswagen could learn a lesson from these guys. <laughs> that's our next review that's coming out after this. Right. Just wait for that one. I wish it was a little brighter in here. The sunroof is an option, an extra cost mm. option, $1,500, and it's necessary. Yeah, it's really, really dark with the dark seats and the dark headliner. Infotainment runs off the latest Uconnect system, which is great mm -hmm. as far as responsiveness, but my issue is when you're in CarPlay or Android Auto, you have your fixed bar on the left, which is your menu, and you got your fixed bar on the top, which is your temperature. The buttons for map, music, and split screen are so small. Mm. Um, I could get to it without gloves, but I'm just kind of stabbing blindly with gloves. The rest of the screen works fine, and you got all sorts of cool information because it is a plug-in hybrid. Right now we're on the power flow, so you can see exactly whether it's the wheels or the battery or the engine providing power and where it's going. It certainly is surprising in a brand new vehicle to see a smaller screen just sort of plunked on top of the center stack like this. The way they've done it looks nice, but I'm surprised they didn't integrate it more into the dash layout. Very clunky, very traditional shifter in Love this. it. Uh, yeah, I, I know. Absolutely love it. It's not buttons, it's not dials, it's not anything ridiculous. My feeling is that BMW and Volkswagen have perfected it with the most recent little tiny flap. Really? That's Yeah, it's not buttons, it's very mechanical feeling, but it's small and out of the way. USB-A, USB-C up front, your drive modes are just to the I guess, top left diagonal of that. It's your regular DNA, dynamic, natural, and advanced efficiency, but let's get to the most important part. Physical HVAC buttons. Mm. A whole beautiful, long, hard plastic row. You cannot mistake it for anything else. It is nice to see in a new vehicle. And the whole thing is angled towards you, mm -hmm. the driver. First thing I noticed when I sat down in the car, not mostly because they're huge <laughs> and you can't miss them, but also <laughs> because they're column mounted. Mm. which is really unusual these days. And if you do any performance driving, you know that from a performance driving perspective, column mounted is considered to be the pinnacle. And so my next thought was, who's driving this car like that? They have to keep the racing heritage, even though it's a subcompact plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. It's their thing. And there's stuff in this that speaks to the idea that they were trying to go performance oriented with this. So we'll get to that in a minute. but. It makes sense for, again, the Alpha Heritage and also mm -hmm. where they were trying to go with this vehicle. It's just really surprising. 
The seats are well bolstered. Mm -hmm. The seat bonnets are not long enough for me. Me either. And also, I don't know if you can see this in the shot, but I barely fit in this car. My head grazes the headliner. Yours does? Yeah. That never happens. I know. Mine often does. Or yeah. not often, but it's not unusual. In this car, I can feel my hair dragging across the headliner as I sit in my usual seating position. Now looking at it, it's the sunroof. Because I can mm. see there's like an inch of reduced space. But I would sit lower down, like I've had to. Mm -hmm. to I can't that. sit lower down. This is as low as the seat goes. My I'm, only option would be to tilt backward, and that is really uncomfortable for me. I would do it to get the extra light mm. in the cabin. So seat quality is good. Seat comfort is good. Seat positioning Not may great. be a deal breaker depending on your body size. Digital instrument cluster, you can configure it three ways. I call it modern, minimal, and extra minimal. You can get the regular numbers that you get in the modern one, but the weird thing is 0, 20, 40, and then 220, 240, 260, are inverted 180 degrees, whereas 60 through 200 is the right way. It's really weird and annoying. <laughs> I know. In this same setup where you have your tachometer, it goes clockwise. So bottom left all the way to bottom right. But if you go to the minimal one, it flips it so that you go from bottom right to bottom left, mm -hmm. which is a little peculiar, but that's the beauty of digital. Yeah. You can do whatever you want and then the super minimal is just more or less a couple of little needles that you see because it's a plug-in hybrid you have electric range and gas range it gives you both and then your overall total onto the driving side so the gasoline portion runs off of a 1.3 liter turbo four-cylinder engine combined power is 285 horsepower 347 pound feet of torque no cvt no yes. e CVT. Points to Alpha for not putting a CVT in here. So good. So it's a six-speed automatic transmission. The electric portion is a 15.5 kilowatt per hour battery, getting you up to 53 kilometers of range. Mm -hmm. There's also a 90 kilowatt electric motor. Now with the all-wheel drive, the 90 kilowatt motor runs the rear wheels and the gasoline engine runs the front. So yes, on that front axle, the 1.3 liter four-cylinder itty bitty engine committee but, turbo for Yeah. I guess it has to be a turbo. It, it has to be a turbo. <laughs> yeah. But you only ever really feel that when you're in e-save mode. Because that's the only time mm. that the engine's running on its own. And you're only ever really going to be in e-save mode when you're, say, cruising on the highway. And you might as well be jamming some power into the battery because you don't really need it at that point anyway. In every other mode, the amount of power is really nice. I have mm. no concerns whatsoever about not having the power that I'd want to in this vehicle. Let's talk about fuel consumption. So it's 8.1s across the board mm -hmm. in liters per hundred kilometers, city, highway, and combined. That's in hybrid mode. Right. Now you get 3.1 liters equivalent yeah. in the EV mode. And again, up to 53 kilometers on a level one charge. It's about 12 hours to go from zero to full. And on a level two, which I don't think a lot of people will use unless they're out in public, uh, it's about three hours. So when you blend the gas tank and the battery, Enercan, our natural resources Canada, figures give us 520 total kilometers on a 42.4 liter tank. It's a little droney in here at highway speeds, mm. I find, and that's through all three drive modes, the D, the N, the A. Noise is... Uh Maybe a little more than average, but mm. speaking of ride and how that all affects everything, let's get into that. All right, you go first. Right. We talked earlier about how Alpha was going for more on the performance side mm -hmm. when equipping this car. One of the things they did was give it McPherson struts on all four corners. Mm. There's also a feature they've added called frequency selective damping. There's a lot of technicalities to it. Really what it boils down to is they're saying that the dampers are going to react more quickly in real time mm. to the, the road surface. In practice, I find it's pretty rough, the Very ride. Nice. Yeah, in- A little stiff. It is, even in the comfort mode. So when you're in normal and the efficiency mode, it gives you the comfort damping. Mm -hmm. When you go into the dynamic mode, it gives you the sport damping. Correct. Even the comfort damping, I find to be pretty stiff. A little uncomfortable, a little bit rocky. If what they were going for here was a high-performance subcompact SUV, then that would be desirable. I just don't know if it's going to be what a lot of SUV buyers are going to be expecting. 
15.6 centimeters on the ground clearance on this. People expect to be able to get over more in an SUV than they can in, say, a hatchback. Now, uh -huh. if you go to, say, a Volkswagen Golf, you're at 13 and change centimeters in ground clearance. So, mm -hmm. but a lot in this segment is in the 17, 18, even 20 centimeter range. So, something to consider. Yes, you're lower to the ground. Yes, it helps with the handling. And but. if that's what you're looking for when you're buying this, then that's great. But don't expect it to be able to clear all kinds of crazy stuff like some other, even subcompact SUVs would be able to. I will wrap up with cargo mm -hmm. for this part. Then we'll get on the pricing and competitors. 648 seats up. 1430 in liters with the seats down. Mm -hmm. There's no spare tire. There's a tire fill kit. And there's a little storage cubby underneath the floor for your charging cable. This is also borderline luxury for me. Mm. They there's... consider themselves luxury. <laughs> well, then I consider myself luxury. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's just some bits and pieces in here that I don't fully categorize with the other mm. luxury competitors. Really nice fit and finish overall, just a little bit's missing. Well, to that point, if you don't care about badges, you can get the same mechanics with a different package in the Dodge Hornet. Not the Dodge Dart that I keep calling No, <laughs> it's a very different car. I asked our story this guy, where's the Dart? <laughs> but yes, built in the same place in mm -hmm. Italy, very similar specs and shapes and all the stuff. Yes, being in the subcompact luxury SUV segment, Pretty broad competitive set here, but none of them are plug-in hybrids unless you want to go up a class. Just to super quickly run through that, mm. in Mercedes land, you're looking at a GLA. 45 has been discontinued, so it's going to be a GLA 35 to get the closest to power that you can to this. And that starts at 56. These are all Canadian figures. The general idea is the same in the U.S., but the pricing is different. Over at BMW, you'd be looking at an X1 or an X2. For 2024, the pricing on that is just over 50 for the X1 and just over 52 for the X2. Audi Q3 mm. for 2024, you're looking at the Q3 45 to be the closest to this on power. That starts at just about 47 and a half. The next closest you'd be looking at would be the Lexus UXH. Fantastic so, vehicle. It is a very good vehicle. So good. Conventional hybrid, not a plug-in hybrid. And in Canada starts at 45, 586 to be precise with fees. Now that doesn't get you the power this does though, 181 horsepower net. I know, it's awesome. Yeah, on that. <laughs> so the Americans is where we start to get into something a little bit more of a discussion. Cadillac, not so much. They did just refresh the X-T4. No mm. hybrid option there, but we can look at it just, just under 45 for the facelift 2024. The Lincoln Corsair, this is where we start to get in, into an interesting discussion. <sighs> they call it a Grand Touring. That's cool. their fancy name for hybrid. That's the plug-in hybrid plug -in trim, hybrid, is the grand, the grand Touring trim. But the Lincoln Corsair is a Ford Escape. That's a class size up right. from this. It's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit more expensive at 62,485. Less range, 43 kilometers. Mm. And only qualifies for half the federal government incentive. In and Canada. provincial yeah. in Canada. And so that this that we're in, the Tonale, qualifies for the full amount of the incentive. But technically it's a compact. Same thing with the BMW X3 plug-in hybrid you could look at, but yeah. that's a lot more expensive, as well as the Lexus NX 450H Plus plug-in hybrid, mm. which again, that's a compact, not a subcompact, but there's more of a discussion here because it's 63,186. That's before the incentives, mm. which it qualifies for the full 61 kilometers of range. And the power is quite a bit higher as well at 304 horsepower. So there is a Sprint trim that's about $5,000 less. The Veloce trim starts at $59,995. Mm -hmm. As tested here, we're looking at $73 and $30. It's well, a bunch of upgrades, only got the yeah. sunroof. The audio is good, not great. Um, and their third little bits and pieces are just nice to have. So the car is just yeah. fine as is if you have a sunroof. I would skip the active assist feet for sure. Yeah, skip the 20 inch wheels. The um, Verde Fangio paint is only available on the Veloce trim and it's $2,000 if you're really uh, drawn to it. Uh, no. Now that pricing does include destination charges and dealer fees, but it does not take off the $5,000 rebate, right. plus the provincial rebates wherever you live. One final point about price to consider though, is there's a lot of standard equipment on this car. Mm -hmm. And that includes that Uconnect 5 with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Wireless charger is standard 
Mm. Plus, you get um, Alexa home to car mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of driver assistance and safety technologies. Some of the highlights that you wouldn't get standard in every luxury would be blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert. Mm -hmm. um, the rear seat monitor, I think, is pretty standard across the board now, driver attention monitor. But you have lane departure warning, lane keep assist, active cruise control, traffic sign recognition, a lot of good stuff for this price. It's a great first effort from a very tiny brand mm. that I feel might get overlooked compared to the other luxury, luxury, luxury and non-luxury competitors. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot, but there will be in the next one, two, three, four years as everybody races towards the 2030, 2035, 2040 goals of being fully electric. I think it's a great little car. The big standout for me is the six-speed automatic transmission. Mm -hmm. Makes driving it so much more enjoyable. Uh, the rest of the piston pieces are good. You can have five digital instrument cluster. The looks are okay. The rims aren't that great. But I would take this out for a second test drive for another week. Okay. I think for right now, this is a great vehicle. Mm -hmm. So uh, Like you said, two, two or three years from now, there should be a lot more competition, especially as everybody's pushing toward electrification. This is a beginning of a push for the Stellantis brands. Yeah. So if you want something small, something that looks good, and you get up to your 53 kilometers range, mm -hmm. you can charge at home. You can also go to the e-save. There's very little to dislike overall for an Alfa Romeo. And it's a unique offering in the subcompact SUV class. Thanks so much for watching. If you haven't already, please hit that button down there that lets you subscribe. Maybe hit that bell too, so you don't miss any more of our videos because we would love for you to see them and watch them and let us know what you think. You can also find us on all the major social media platforms. So please seek us out and thanks for watching.